is that idea about hybrid hybridity and hybrid spaces is because of the pandemic and because of the way that we're what we're doing right now that idea about hybrid working situations hybrid places working between the physical and the virtual that's all become suddenly part of everyday mm-hmm. everyday language for, for many of us i mean not for, not obviously for everybody but for many of us and i wonder whether we might explore that notion of hybridity a bit more fruitfully then uh, paul maybe you could say something a little bit about um about how digital and physical layers exist in a exist from your point of view. Um, one of our tasks as digital place place making fellows has been um, uh, to reclaim or recuperate perhaps the, um, the the term digital place making because for me that's a term that has become associated with smart cities, but it's also become associated with. Um, I guess, big corporate projects like Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. And, you know, it's become associated, I guess, with capturing our location-based data. Um, it's, it's become about commodifying those, um, those digital layers um, and, in a way, um, commodifying our bodies and our behaviours. And it's become associated with surveillance capitalism. So, so, so for me, um, it's about um, trying to optimize Occupy those um, those digital layers um, and to, to to reclaim them. And perhaps a, a way that I'd like to think about it is um, is to think about uh, digital space making rather than digital place making. So how we might occupy those digital layers or reclaim those digital layers, and how we might um, make space in those digital layers for other voices, perhaps for underrepresented um, voices um, and. Uh, for for other cultures um, and for for other stories, for instance, to um, to use those digital layers to surface the historical narratives, um, to reveal historical narratives that might have been hidden um, in our in our cities, and yeah, to to make space for um, for the for the publishing of um, of yeah other cultural content um, that that is place related. So that's one of the thoughts I have. I guess is about making digital space rather than digital place making yeah that that makes me think about the way that we inhabit um you know actual physical cities in the way that there are all sorts of there are safe spaces and unsafe spaces and people make safe spaces for themselves in different kinds of ways and they make inclusive or exclusive spaces in different ways for themselves and they make communities and they make connections they have private spaces in cities they have places that are very personal to them and then they also have little small group spaces and cultural spaces and so on and yet none of that nuance seems available to us in the digital realm it all feels as though it's very standardized and somehow doesn't respond to the day-to-day texture of our cultural being and our, our personal and private existence. That's very much the way I was starting to think about this project and what we mean by digital placemaking and my engagement with the elders at Fairfield House. It's a space that has um, senior citizens there. It's had a day centre there for the last 27 years. So when I'm going into that space, I'm very conscious that the language that we're using is within the discourse of the academia and how would that then scaffold and play out if I go into a community space with elders that aren't privy to those kinds of languages. So very often, you know, when I'm talking about digital placemaking, those spaces, I'm talking about with them, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how technology, you know, enters our life. How do you use technologies in your day-to-day practices? And my research is very much based around the everyday life experience. So, for example, when I start to speak to this with one of the elder gentlemen at Fairfield House, straight away, he's started to relate to it in relation to how he lived in his and his life and he then took me out into the car park and showed me his hybrid car and he's got a hybrid car that's got all these gadgets in there you know for me it looks like star trek i'm the younger in that relationship but he was teaching me about the technologies in that space the digital dashboard how it tells you when the battery's running down then you have to then get fuel etc etc and that very much that very much is how digital technology is now navigating and enhancing his experience of where he is in the world and actually how he's traveling through the world and that was an element that I hadn't really thought about before so I actually think you know for me my my methodology I guess is working from the ground up how do we use it in our everyday life what's happening already rather than me going in with a projection of what I think could be happening and for me that actually opened up a whole range of learning that I wouldn't have expected previously. 
I think placemaking can only be as inclusive as the population that's engaged in the process. And I think we all know that. And um, it might seem like a very obvious point, but I mean, a lot of us have talked about um, finding it difficult to engage with people who are not already in a policy making uh, kind of capacity, or there are a lot of communities already in the Bristol and Bath region who are consistently ignored and marginalized and only included when uh, people want to make profit off them or they want to seem like they are ticking boxes and a lot of communities are only engaged on an initial consulting level and then kind of left in the dust. And as a person of colour, as a Chinese person of Southeast Asian descent and also a queer person, I find it very difficult to navigate physical spaces, but also spaces um, mostly where people are only focused on one particular type of thing. And I find myself having to compartmentalize myself. Um, and I think that's where this, this concept of hybrid space is really important because how do you create hybrid spaces, not just physically, but through the physical kind of be able to suggest to people that you can be your whole selves in these spaces with these other people in the space. When I was doing my um, interview chats with um, a couple of queer volunteers, one of them pointed out and I thought made a very good point about how do we try and innovate without accidentally kind of adhering to structures that are already very damaging um, and come from a very kind of colonialist perspective um, and I don't have an answer for that but I guess that's what we're all here for today. Yeah thanks I, 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 uh, I that, that's exactly right Tim and and I, I actually that connects with some things that I know that Will's been thinking about in his fellowship which is about the importance of those kinds of private and personal perspectives on this so so how do you can you know connecting up the an understanding of the intersectional aspects of the conversation with the very subjective and personal elements of what that really means for people and how that connects into the conversation. Will, can you can you say something, say a little bit about that now? Do you know, I like the fact that you asked me to say a little bit <laughs> because it's just like such a broad topic. But I think just like what Tim's talking about is 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 kind of playing on this idea of authenticity, uh, which is really important in the type of conversations I was holding for my research, um, and how we can use authenticity as a as a like influential kind of like variable or component of data collection as well. I suppose 2020 has been a year where everyone's had to reassess what the idea of normal is. And even before we got to this point, there was that like flippant comment of what even is normal, you know, when people are working, uh, working to explore more ideas of inclusivity um, and equity, just just all around. There's so many, so many multiple facets to any individual's identity. Uh, and, and my kind of like upbringing has forced me to be somewhat of a chameleon. I uh, grew up in like pretty much in, in a really impoverished situation in, in South London, but I went to a really highly, highly traditional middle class private school uh, and and had to deal with the duality of my identity in that space, whilst not even being able to explore the reality of actually being black uh, and being too black in one space, not black enough in, a, in another space, uh, constantly going out with my family and being considered as the adopted one. Um, so all of these different facets of our identity are things that I had to address like from early on. So that was where my research kind of like had to start off you know like how can as as Tim mentioned how can we allow more of ourselves to be present in this space and what does it mean for the people and the systems that are in the positions of power in those spaces what are their I suppose real problems to keep it quite keep it quite frank and short um because like like I, mean, I was quite explicit about being a man earlier um, 
there are so many elements of your day to day that you take for granted when you're in a position of privilege and the process one has to go through in order to be able to identify that privilege and therefore act on it and do your best to learn more and make a space more equitable is a tricky one. So my research wasn't nice. Uh, I was doing work for cultural and I am still doing work for cultural organizations, but the kind of conversations that they have to have are really in internal reflective ones about themselves as staff, about their position in society, um, as well as about what their organization, how their lived experience maps into the systems that allow their organizations to stay afloat and sustain itself. Um, uh, a, a brief conversation with uh, a director or an engagement producer of one organization uh, when they kind of when we were exploring my research and how it was going to manifest in the physical space as well as how it would manifest in the digital space one of the responses was I don't think our audience will take too well to this kind of intervention and my response was well what does that say about your audience like you're you're at a point it's 2019, 2020, 21st century, the world is changing and you can identify that your audience fits a very specific demographic. Culture has completely evolved since that demographic were at an age where they were young enough to be influenced in the future as people, as the kind of like people in the spaces that we're holding uh, right now are. So where do you want to be in 30 years? Because in 30 years, 40 years, your audience that you're catering to now will no longer be here, but you would have completely isolated the audience that will be prevalent, the people that will be spending money, people that will be making decisions in 40 years time would have been totally isolated by you for four decades. So where do you intend to be in that moment in time? Do you know what I mean? And we have to ask ourselves about sustainability um, and, and all of the things that come with it. And, and you can't do that from what I learned in the research, facing the apathy as well as facing the kind of like um, desire for change and improvement. You can't do that kind of research if you aren't reflecting on what your lived experience is bringing to these situations and how your implicit bias affects the kind of policies that you're creating.